I'm going to broadcast. Um, and what else do I need to do? Launch the entry poll. Launch poll. Slowly oh. getting there. Great. So hi to everyone that's joining. Um, thanks very much for tagging along. I um, hope you can see everybody. Um, we'll just give it another minute or so for everybody to sign on. Um, but thanks very much for taking the time out to uh, come and join our second webinar. Um, you should be seeing um, an entry poll on the screen. Just a couple of questions there, um, which would be great if you could just take a moment to um, to answer those, so we can we can just share the results of those um, just before we um, just before we get going. Uh, Nina, I can see you right there. Promote to panelist. Um, you should be joining very shortly. There we go. Nina, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Doing well, how are you? Really good, thank you. Really good. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time out to, um, to join us and to sit on the panel this, this afternoon in my corner of the world or this morning <laughs> in, 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 in yours. Um, it's really good, of you to, really good of you to join us. Um, so I will give it another 30 seconds or so. And uh, just as we were saying, there's the entry poll on the screen. So if you've just joined, please do uh, answer, the, um, answer the questions um, that, are, that are up there. And then we'll just discuss this briefly at the beginning. That's great. Okay, so let's get started. So, um, yeah, so this is the second in our Two Eds Are Better Than One webinar series. Um, and um, the whole idea, if you weren't on the first one, is that um, what we wanted to do really was to, um, I guess, just focus on conversations from both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and um, given, you know, my base in, in, in London and Ed's base in New York and really just bring together some interesting people who we would all love to hear from and to, 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 to learn from um, who are you know, either in the hospitality sector or uh, associated with it. Um, and um, hopefully have some really interesting and insightful conversations um, about some of the big issues that are facing the hospitality sector, um, both generally and obviously off the back of, of the current global landscape that we're, that we're, we're, we're seeking. Uh, or seeing at the moment. Um, so Ed and I have known each other for a number of years and we kind of pitch, each, uh, pitch against each other during the day uh, and, and um, win some projects and lose some projects. So we have a kind of friendly working relationship and a rivalry and then um, like to share a few beers of an evening when we are in the same city. So we have a, we have a kind of close friendship there as well. So hi everyone, this is the other Ed. And, um... Just before we get started, I wanted to um, uh, inform everyone about a, a new date for your diaries. Uh, so the next session will be on Tuesday, the 28th of July, at the same time. Uh, we're just working through the panelists for that um, forthcoming discussion, and we hope you can join us then. Um, and uh, the format for today, we, we're going to start with some quick introductions of, the, of ourselves and the panelists. And um, then uh, throughout the discussion, uh, we would ask you to post questions uh, using the, the chat link on the Zoom. And um, at the end of the panel discussion, we'll uh, try to answer as many of those um, amongst the group that we have here assembled today. So uh, once again, thanks so much for joining and um, looking forward to the session ahead. Um, so yes, yeah, so just in case you guys don't know, so um, I, I'm the founder and strategy director um, at a London-based creative company called the Rebel Agency, and um, we work almost exclusively with restaurants, bars, hotels, and um, everything from concept development to brand strategy and graphic design and digital marketing, and um, we are a kind of a company that 
likes to lead with purpose, but also to bring sustainability impact and purpose into the projects that we work on as well. And so we've got kind of a, a wide and varied client list um, um, of various hospitality companies around the world. And um, just a quick intro to Pure Grey. So um, Pure Grey was formed in 2017 um, as part of Marriott International. Our focus is restaurant and bar concept development for high opportunity destinations around the world. Um, as much as we're, we're wholly owned by Marriott, we also operate with, uh, with other hotel groups, with independent operators. Uh, we have 20 operating restaurants, not all currently operating, sadly, uh, but 20 restaurants around the world and about 75 projects in development. Um, so, um, yeah, our team is made up of um, uh, culinarians, beverage experts, service trainers, brand strategists, graphic designers, project managers. So we really have a, a holistic perspective on, on how to design, develop, and operate the restaurant itself around the world. Um, so um, perhaps on this side of the pond, we'll start with, with Nina. Perhaps you can introduce yourself. Good morning, everybody. My name is Nina Compton. I am the chef owner of Compella Pen and Buy What American Bistro here in New Orleans. I am originally from the island of St. Lucia, and I have resided in the U.S. for about 20 years. Amazing. Thanks, Nina. And then over here in the U.K., um, Melanie, would you like to say hi? Hi, everyone. My name is Melanie Zabi. I'm London via Canada, hence the accent. I am a change and strategy consultant for Accenture, but I also run two huge uh, diversity programs. One of them, the Women of the World Festival around gender equality, and the other one, the Black British Business Awards around equality in with ethnicity and race. Fantastic. And Henrietta? Um, Henrietta Lovell. I um, have founded Rare Tea back in 2004. It's a direct trade tea business that mostly focuses on the hospitality sector. We bring tea from around the world, from small independent producers to the consumer through hospitality business. Well, that was where it was. And um, I also founded Rare Charity, which returns a percentage of revenue back to the farms for educational scholarships. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much again for, uh, for sitting in on this. Um, and so at the beginning, we asked a couple of questions. So I'm just going to share the uh, share the poll results here. And this is just really around kickstarting this conversation around what we can learn from the kind of current global landscape from Black Lives Matter, from um, the COVID-19 outbreak, and I guess a lot of kind of underlying issues that we, we've all been aware of within the hospitality industry and also the world at large for a long time that have come to the come to the fore um, over the last few months. So the first question was thinking about equality, equity and sustainability. Have you made positive changes in your business practices and operations since the beginning of lockdown? 27% um, of people uh, have, have not, 45% of people have made some small changes, 9% uh, have made some fundamental changes and 18% have not yet made changes but are planning to do so um, and then in terms of how Black Lives Matter movement uh, has influenced how you employ and manage your people and source ingredients and products for your business 32% uh, not at all 27% somewhat 18% quite a lot 9% fundamentally and 14% uh, asked uh, uh, responded as as as, as other um, and so without further ado um, over to Ed to um, post the first question Okay, hey, perfect. So um, we'll start with a question for each of the panelists. Um, and just last session, we, we posed a question around uh, the, everyone's perspective on the future of the hospitality industry in terms of operations, uh, design, communications, marketing, etc. Uh, and today we really wanted to focus on issues around our, our practices, our principles, uh, our consumption and our impact on the world around us. Um, so. We could start with Nina. Considering uh, the devastation of the pandemic uh, in terms of the, the virus itself, the, the travel bans, uh, the severe and lasting economic impact, uh, alongside, as I mentioned, the Black Lives Matter movement, recent protests in the US and around the world, uh, what is the biggest change that you see ahead in the hospitality industry? Well, it's, it's funny because this pandemic has really brought a lot of things to the forefront. Um, you know, we closed our restaurants here in the States March 15th. Um, I think it was pretty much across the board, most restaurants closed. 
And I think that was kind of a, a shocking mo moment for everybody because we never thought that we'd have to close our restaurants. Um, so I think that was one thing that we had to deal with of trying to pivot towards, you know, takeout and everything else. And that has been an ongoing issue with restaurants now is constantly thinking on your feet um, because the old model doesn't work. But I think that that's one of the things that a lot of restaurants are moving towards is trying to develop a model that is pandemic proof right now, you know, in case we get shut down a second time. Um, because as we're seeing some of the states right now, California um, closed restaurants and bars last week, Florida just closed restaurants and bars yesterday. So you're constantly living on the edge. And I think this is something that we have to constantly think about is what if we get shut down a second time, what will we do to survive? That is kind of on the forefront of every restaurant owner right now. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, you have the racial divide in this country that is very heated, still, you know, going on almost over a month now. And that is something that I think has been, you know, kind of stifled and put in the back for a while. And for it to come to the forefront, I think is really powerful right now because it's giving people a voice. It's giving people a chance to speak up. It's given people uh, a chance to also look into their, their, their businesses and look at, you know, who they're employing, who are they giving a second chance, who are they giving, you know, uh, training models on all these things or just a, a better life period. So I think that now people are really digging in and saying, okay, I need to make a change and how am I going to make the change? You see a lot of people going to race equity classes um, just to understand why the system is messed up. Um, and also trying to break that cycle. You see a lot of people supporting black businesses now because they never, it was just never on their minds. So I think that we're, we're moving in a positive direction and making those changes. But I think what this pandemic has brought to the forefront for me is the awareness of all the issues that we've never tackled before because we are always just so busy running our restaurant. And now we've actually had a second to stop and think about what's important here. And I think the pandemic is kind of a good thing um, because it's made us sit down and really face these things head on. I, I really like that idea, trying to find a, a positive perspective and that, that phrase you use, pandemic proof, I think is yeah, it's really critical for all businesses. Um, hey, Henrietta, what about yourself? How, what do you see as the biggest change ahead for, for your business and, and the hospitality industry? I, it's, again, I think there is a positive in that pause and that thinking. I think we're much more conscious consumers now. You know, our pounds or our dollars are valuable to us and where are we going to spend them? And in the restaurants, it's in the places that we really love. It's the places that we really care about. It's the places that mean something to us in our community. And I think that people are, have shown that in the, in the lockdown. If they can support, they will support and that's where they want to go back to. And when they go there, it's because they love them because those people really care about what they do. And I feel that that's gonna be a real positive in, as we go forward, because those people are the people who support great farmers, great suppliers. You know, uh, Farron Adria once said, if you look for great taste, you're gonna find great people because they go hand in hand, whether it's the producer or the person who's serving you or the, or the chef. Mm -hmm. So I see great hope for people doing things a little bit differently, doing things thoughtfully, just from the consumer point of view and from the restaurant point of view. Do yeah. you think it's almost an acceleration of what we were seeing anyway, which is people, you know, we throw as, as an agency, we like to throw words like, you know, authenticity and transparency around, but the, it, it, it's, it's definitely something that has become much more important and, and we, we expected it to become essential. So do you think it's almost just accelerated that, that change mm -hmm. and the businesses are, that are winning now are the ones that already had an emotional connection to their client base, to their producers, and were able to kind of bring all of those stories together? Yes, and I think when we mentioned things like sustainability or um, fairness or ethical trade, there are people much more open to listening to that than they might have been before. That's great. And, you know, it, it's all well and good while we have this time to think and, and hope and imagine the future. We've just got to hope that people actually act on it. Um, so, so, Mel, from, from your perspective, um, sort of outside of the hospitality industry looking in, 
Um, what do you think we really need to do to, to change for the best for the future? I think that in order, for the first time in history, I think, no, for the first time, probably about 50 years, the Black Lives Matter movement and racial equality movement is no longer on the shoulders and souls of Black people solely. So I find that there's a new accountability that my white allies and peers and, and friendship groups, where they're saying, oh crap, moment of clarity. You know what, the micro decisions that we make in hiring, the micro decisions that we make in consumption, all contribute towards racial inequality. And that's wonderful. That's a wonderful day. I don't, and I don't think it's happened quite to this degree in a very long time. The organizations, you know, they're like literally just being rushed off my feet because organizations are trying in new and fresh ways saying, wait a minute, let's take responsibility for the injustices that are happening. And how do we, how do we address the balance? So I am hoping that this is really a, a watershed moment. But on the other hand, I also know that you know, COVID is real, and it's real in a way for the being communities and Black communities that, um, in regards to the numbers that are being felt, you know, we're, we're actually in the midst of mourning and grieving on um, not only for George Floyd and kind of the violated, kind of the violations we're seeing, but we're also mourning because of our own people as well. And so it's actually quite a fragile place. And, and why this is important is because Community is our superpower. Like any kind of black person, black Caribbean person, like my, my mom's from Trinidad, we, like we get together and it's, it's food and it's love and it's our community. And, and then to not have the hospitality industry, <laughs> to be able to kind of support that and undergird that, it's almost like you've taken away a superpower of, of human beings, of humanity. And so you're right, there is this kind of refocus on where am I really um, kind of, where, um, what's important to me? What's driving my consumption? What decisions are driving my consumption? Um, who do I, uh, it almost, it's almost like there's a, a, a kind of a, a contraction of how am I taking care of my home, myself, my family, my friends. And part of that is, for, like, yeah, part of that is, is food and it's events and it's bringing people together. So it's just a really weird intersectional time. And I'm not quite sure how we're going to get out of it. Um, <laughs> Well, I know we are, but because we're just inventive people, but you know, it's, it's one step at a time because it's actually quite a lot in terms of se our senses. Sure. Yeah, not just how, but, but when. Yeah. How we're gonna take. yeah. Um, okay, perfect. So, um, so moving forward, uh, perhaps another question for, for Nina. Um, as, a, as a person of color in the US in hospitality, uh, what has your personal experience been as you've uh, risen through the ranks and um, thinking specifically about your experience, um, what still needs to change? Well, I think the, the, the biggest thing for me was, um, you know, I, when I moved here, I was, I was coming here for school and my plan was just to come to school, you know, do one year work experience and then go back home to the Caribbean. And I kind of wanted to extend that a little bit longer because I felt like I had so much to learn as, as a young chef. And, you know, I, I did work in a, quite a few restaurants, you know, here, and I was the only black cook in the kitchen, you know, and it's not very inclusive. Um, and also being, being a black immigrant woman doesn't make it any easier. Um, and I think that it, it's just been that way for so long um, that it's just, you have to accept that. And, you know, as I, I, I kind of looked at it as I can't let this hold me back. I'm here to learn from the best chefs and I'm just going to suck it up. So I didn't really have a voice. Um, you know, I had a lot of people make comments to me. Um, two years ago, I won a James Beard and, you know, people were saying, well, you know, you didn't win that because of your talent. You won that because of the Me Too movement and because they're trying to focus on black immigrants now and that's why you want the thing. So when you have people throw those comments at you, you, you kind of taken aback like, really? And I actually, I had somebody this year say to me, um, you know, I'm, I'm never gonna win a James Beard Award because I'm a white male chef. And I looked at him and I said, you guys have been winning this for decades. You know, just because they're, they're trying to change the landscape 
and make the broaden their horizons a little bit that you feel like you're not going to win because you're a white male you know so th that the mentality has been ingrained in the industry that you know the white male chef is the superior the the be all the end all um and i think we have kind of conditioned ourselves to accept that and i think with what's going on right now we you know, for me especially, it was very emotional seeing what's happening because I was being interviewed um, by a magazine. They said, you know, what do you think about these protests? And I'm like, I, I really don't know because is this a flash in the pan where people are just, you know, quarantine? Are they really upset about this because they have nothing else to do? Or do they really feel that this needs to be a change? And as the days went by, because it was very, very heated here and I could see that people were saying like, you know, this is wrong, this needs to change. So I feel like we're at a point now where, especially in the restaurant industry, I've talked to a lot of my peers who are white that own multiple restaurants are saying that we need to make a change. And they've come to me and they said, you know, Nina, how do you think that we approach this the right way so we're, we're not offending people? And I think that's, that's the biggest thing is how do we not, how do we make this change in a very respectful way um, and not like the white guilt of, I'm just going to throw money at them all of a sudden so I just don't get called out. They want to do it in a respectful way. But I think the biggest thing is it has to be a long-term project. This is not something you can just say, well, I donated, you know, $1,000 to this charity and I've done my part. This has to be long-term. And I tell people this, it starts with the communities. It starts with working in those neighborhoods that are impoverished, that are food deserts. Um, that's how you start to make the change. It's, it's, it's in people's neighborhoods, it's in their homes, start making the changes there and then it'll come into the workplace because I think that is a foundation where we have to start to change. Yeah, absolutely. It's really interesting. And I think it's just, it really echoes my own personal experience. And, you know, Ned and I, we were talking about this, um, last week, um, in your, in, in, in your garden. And it's like the fact that I had to go outside of the industry of my network to find people to come and have this conversation with and it's just really it's really provoked this kind of fuck you know what are we you know it, 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 it and it just just how you said at the beginning it's about us all taking this burden of this 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 huge issue on our on our shoulders and not being afraid to to have the conversations and ask the and ask and ask the questions agreed uh, so so Nina, you mentioned a couple of things uh, you know, I, I agree with your point about um the change beginning at home uh, within your own community. Um, you, you mentioned sorry, uh, a dialogue with your, your team, um, training, etc. cetera. Um, what, are you, what else are you doing to um, make positive changes um, within the workplace and within your team? Well, I, I think it starts with, you know, giving people a chance. That start, that's, that's where it begins. You know, the restaurant industry has been, you know, the labor pool has always been very small because, you know, restaurants are busy. You can't really hire somebody that's not um, experienced. So you have to, you know, get those people that have experience. And I kind of stepped away from that a little bit. I started hiring people that had little experience, but they had a really good attitude. And I, I felt like those people stayed with me longer because I trained them myself, I mentored them. I said, hey, when you're making that vinaigrette, call me or we'll make it together. And I'm sorry, my video was off. Um, and I said, you know, it was, that was the biggest thing for me was working alongside them because they felt like, oh my gosh, she really does care. She's spending the time to train me. And, you know, it was constant training. And that's why I tell my staff all the time is you have to train people and make them feel confident. And a, a lot of people were actually black that didn't have any experience. They didn't know what, um, you know, a Blanc was. They didn't know what, you know, all these different things that we get back. Like, Chef, what is that? What is that uh, you're cutting up? Oh, it's chanterelle mushrooms. And like, oh my gosh, those are beautiful. Where are they coming from? Because they're, they're not exposed to those things. So for me, it was kind of like a, a mini culinary school where I'd say, hey, today I'm going to show you how to, you know, make the bablan because you didn't know how to make it. And that's where it started. And, and as that started to build, I started hiring more people 
groups that were not experienced and basically giving them the chance because they felt good about themselves. They, they wanted to come to work because they were learning so much. They were excited. And that's how it starts. And then I also work very closely with a lot of charities here in New Orleans with young boys or young kids that are, you know, some of them are fatherless boys. I work with Son of the Saint, that's a charity. I'm actually doing a cooking class with them today. I'm doing a cooking class with six or seven boys. We're making spaghetti pomodoro today. So those are the things where, you know, they're cooking with their parents or their, their grandmother or their siblings. And it's just that interaction. I think what, for me, that brings me the most joy is, for me, I take those things for granted, making spaghetti pomodoro, but for them, they're so excited asking all these questions like, chef, do I put the, the sauce in now or do I add the salt? And so those things, you know, when we did our first class, they're like, okay, what are we going to cook next week, chef? And I'm like, well, what do you want to cook? You know, and for me, giving those kids just the, the basic fundamentals of cooking those things at home is sharing a little joy for me and a little joy for them. And I feel like a lot of, you know, kids that come from neighborhoods that are, you know, they're, they're disadvantaged, they don't really have the love and, and the security. So if I can extend it from my restaurant to their home, you know, I think that is a great thing because it's about giving back to the community. So I am very heavily involved in, in, in a few charities around here. Mm -hmm. And that's really the sense of community, isn't it? And we talk about this a lot with restaurants and forming communities and everything else. And I remember reading an article recently, and I can't remember where it was published, but it said, you know, it was about a New York restaurant. And it said, you know, people are really concerned about the, um, the welfare of the bees that produce their kind of natural honey, but right. they actually don't care that there's undocumented migrants and uh, it, it working in the kitchens. And then there's, there's, there's destitution, you know, on the neighborhoods, on the, on the doorsteps of the, right. of the restaurants and there's a fundamental disconnect between the demands and expectations of, of clientele um, and actually what is needed to create a really kind of rounded, holistic solution to the problem. Um, Melanie, I'd love to come over to you and just um, hear a little bit more about what maybe hospitality can learn and take from, you know, your kind of two worlds of creative and, 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 and corporate and particularly, you know, the the number of entrepreneurs that you come into contact with with the Black British Business Awards, and um, I guess the question is, what what hospitality can take from industries which are potentially slightly more structured and cautious and rounded in their approach to all of these issues that we're talking about? You're on mute, darling. You're right. Hospitality is afforded flexibility because of the, the nature and the size of the organizations. So they're not as kind of structured and, and metric in that way. On one hand, that's great because that means that we can move to change things. But on the other hand, that means that there's been no metrics. There's been no, you know, there's not a real kind of accountability in regards to diversity and inclusion, um, you know, and kind of celebrating difference. So I kind of take when I, you know, in terms of the, the, in terms of people from the hospitality industry, I kind of take a hard line with you and say, look, if you're in a room and you see everyone kind of looks like you, lives in the same neighborhood, speaks like you, then pretty much, you know, you have a problem. Like that's, that's just the way it is. If you look in your friendship circle and you say, oh, well, I, you know, you, you have the, the same friendship circle and you all shop in the same places and make all the same choices. then again, you have a problem. And when I say a problem, I mean that you need to be taking responsibility for the fact that decisions that you have made has driven a non-inclusive culture. Does that mean you're a racist? No, but there's a difference between being non-racist and being anti-racist and so i think this where blm is so key like first of all i really want to differentiate blm black lives matter it's about black people not getting killed when they get arrested like let's keep it really hundred like all of this diversity inclusion with our organizations and stuff like that you know giving people a chance like what we're talking about at the bare bones is just life and the opportunity to just be arrested 
and not get shot in the back. And I, and why that needs to be differentiated is because, you know, I, I don't want to do a disservice to the BLM movement, nor diversity and inclusion for kind of small businesses. It, just when we make decisions with our, with our restaurants and the hospitality industry, it doesn't necessarily mean that the BLM protest and the source of the BLM process is going to be solved. And I think that's really key that we differentiate that because that, that privilege to live, that's what we're fighting for as part of BLM. With diversity and inclusion, what I'm seeing large organizations do, which is great, is that they're looking through their whole supply chain. And let's not look at like kind of inclusion as just who do we hire? It's everything from, wait a minute, all the way through our customers. How do we engage our customers? How do we represent for our customers? How do we market to the right, you know, to a diverse set of customers? all the way through to our talent. So who's on the shop floor, who is serving, who is in the back, who's cooking, who is managing, all the way through to our supply chains and saying, okay, who, where are we sourcing our ingredients? Who are we working with? And that comprehensive view, I don't think we've necessarily, we haven't mastered it, <laughs> but that's where, you know, it, um, that's where it affords us the most opportunity to really make change, to say, okay, like, you know, let's take, there's some risks that we can take. It's not just about who's serving our food or who's cooking the food. Like, it, let's not, that's just so limited. It's all the way from, wait a minute, if we market in, so for, like, if we market our, for our restaurant in The Guardian, we're going to get a certain type of people because we know that Guardian readers lead, you know, they lean towards one way. Like the Times, they lean another way. <laughs> And that's okay, but let's just think about how we are marketing and how we are attracting and how we are engaging different communities and then kind of put it all the way through the pipeline to say, you know, who's working for us and then also where are we getting our supplies? Who are we working with in terms of our supplier base? That's what's so key is that we're all, we're, we're, we're a mini supply chain for hospitality. Like we're, it's, like a, it's actually quite the, the, the ramifications of the decisions that we make along those points um, can make some really big, really, really big impact. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think that segues nicely into, in, in, into a chat, you know, a couple of questions in your direction, Henrietta. And I think the, 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 the commercial reality and the challenge, I guess, and, you know, especially looking at things through a kind of central London lens is that there's so much pressure on price points and you know we've got the you know the living wage is increasing all the time and rents and rates are going up and brexit's screwing the pound against the euro so ingredients prices from europe are going up you know on average 14% over the last 12 months if i have my have my facts correct and so it, it, it's really difficult but almost more important than ever to really stand by your purpose and your principles and your and your morals and i certainly believe that that there's a there's a challenge now is that is the price of eating out inevitably going to increase which in itself pre reflects on the accessibility and therefore the inclusivity of, 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 of hospitality but i think yeah taking it right back to the farms and and and, and the, the human beings that are that are growing and living off the produce that we're all we're all buying um henrietta what's what's kind of happened and what's changed since 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 covid what pressures have you found yourself under either from 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 the purchasing side of things or from the supply side there's so much there there's so much i want to say there's so much to unpack from all that you've both said it was as a well. long question and, and nina though as well i mean that respect is so important respect in our community respect for one another in our community. And that community is a little wider. I think the restaurant industry has understood a little bit that it goes to local farmers and, you know, we can supply um, really great produce and support local farmers and those farmers matter and those, and that long-term sustainability of our environment and our countryside and the, and the beautiful produce that we want to get. So we do think about dairy farmers perhaps and winemakers. And then from there, we can go a little further and who's actually making the food and drink that we enjoy. And if we constantly expect it to be cheaper, there's going to be an impact of that. And like in the tea industry that I know most, and I can speak of best, uh, price of tea has been dropping considerably over the years. And that's really to maintain profit margins. And you can say that it's not uh, economically viable to buy a bit better, but it's not economically viable to keep 
getting cheaper. I can't say that any more clearly. Life expectancy in the place that most people in Europe and North America get their teeth rarely reaches above 50. Now we wouldn't accept that in the, in the wine industry. We wouldn't accept that for our families. And we're connected to those people in every sip of tea we drink. And so when people call it posh tea, I get so upset. Okay, yeah, I'm a white posh woman, but that doesn't mean I sell posh tea. I tell decent tea that gets a decent price to the farmer. It's got nothing to do with class. It's got to do with an economic uh, exchange. If, uh, if we keep thinking things have to get cheaper, they also get worse. And we don't expect that. Can I go back to wine? We don't expect that in wine. If we buy something good in wine, we don't expect the price to constantly be falling. In fact, wine prices go up. Um, decent beer. We are prepared to pay more for decent beer and uh, decent spirits, maybe decent olive oil. And you know who makes wine and olive oil? Mostly white people. And I think we've got in tea, it's East Africa, it's India, it's Sri Lanka that's producing most of the tea that we drink. And how can we conscionably drink something that is keeping people in poverty? And that's real poverty. That's not, you know, kind of pretend poverty. That's, you know, things that we wouldn't accept for our own families. And so including that community a little bit further in all the products that we, and all the choices we make, as Melanie said, starts to build that respect and you don't just build it in, in yourself, you build it in your group, in your hotel, in your restaurant, in your, in your front of house staff, your chefs. When, you, when you're making great decisions on where you get things that really support people and support communities and support real fundamental change, then you get uh, loyalty in your, in your family. And then you get loyalty from your customers because they talk about that and they say, well, this is what we're doing. And with tea, we're really talking about a few pence more. So you know, I hate to, I hate to, um, to bore about this, but most of my customers get a 90% gross profit margin and they call my tea posh. You know, like I buy direct from a farm at a price the farm sets rather than a commodity market through brokers and they still get a 90% gross profit margin. So when you want to get a 98% gross profit margin, I would probably call that theft. Yeah. yeah so it's yeah. definitely affordable and change can happen and, Restaurants can lead that, and they have been leading that. And they, so it goes from your community in your restaurant to your wider community to support the world community in a, new, in a, in a way that's so inclusive. Um, it makes the world a better place, and it's a win for everybody. You get better quality, you pay a bit more, and it's these small changes. They're not unsustainable changes. They're not economically unviable changes, but not to make the change is unviable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I wish on too much? Sorry about the. No, no, it was great. It was great, and I actually want to talk a little bit about rare charity as well in a second. But just just before I do so, just um, to just a shout out to the uh, to the um, the audience. Um, we'd love to have some questions um, from you guys that we can come to in about ten or fifteen minutes and just close the session with a bit of a Q and A. So, do use the. Um, the Q&A function uh, within Zoom to just fire some questions um, over to us and then we'll, we'll, we'll take some of those and pose them. So you can either do them generally to everybody or um, to specific people on the, on the, on the panel. Um, so it's an interesting point about your, this, 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 this price challenge, Henrietta, and I think it'd be great to hear a little bit about, about rare tea, but I guess what I'm interested in, in understanding is what is the real price difference. I mean, if I'm buying an FMCG Unilever, I don't want to badmouth anybody, a PG Tips or a, 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 a you know, uh, who, so, somebody else, sorry, I'm gonna get, gonna get slandered. Um, what, what are we talking about in terms of pounds, shillings and pence, in terms of what it takes to provide um, a yeah. livelihood for the farmers, their families and the communities? Well, here's the status quo, here's the reality of it is now. 90% of the tea we drink in North America and Europe, and that's a pretty accurate figure, as far as I can find out with all the research that they've done, it is about 90% is bought and sold by seven companies. And from there, it, it mostly it's born at, uh, bought at auction, and those seven companies then sell to all the other little brokers and brokers to uh, tea companies and, and to consumers. But they are controlling those seven companies where the price of tea is and it's dropping and yet 
life expectancy and quality of life is not improving. So there's something fundamentally wrong there in that system. And I believe that has to change. And the way to do that is not to buy from those seven that keep the status quo where it is. And they, you can add things like um, ethical tea partnership or fair trade, and they can put little things that are a little bit better into a fundamentally flawed system, but we need to change the system altogether. And so that's by, I believe by direct trade, when you have a relationship with a farm, then you can make sure that the value of the, your, of your, of your money goes to the farm and not to brokers all along the way. It could be, you know, 30 people before it, between the exchange from the consumer and the farmer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it is very hard to rip someone off when you know them and you know their family and you know their community. You know, you want to have a, a more uh, um, responsible relationship when you know that person. And from there, there's quality. You know, when you buy something that's made by a machine, an industrial product, let's say um, a fish finger, what do you call it, a fish stick in America, you know that's made by a machine, right? And it's cheap. And it doesn't matter what you do to it. It's very difficult to make that into something very elevated that you'd sell in a restaurant. But if you buy something crafted and beautiful that's been made to be the best it could be, then you've got potential for real value, real added value. And and that's what I'm trying to create, a value market. So not only buying direct, but buying the best quality you can, which takes more jobs, more skill, more labor, not just something produced by a machine. So those two things are super important to buy from someone the best they can produce. So it's not, they're not asking for um, philanthropy or you to be you know, a good person by helping buying the tea, but an equitable trade, buy something really good because it's worth more. And if we keep looking at the cheapest product, that's going to that's going to have a, a horrible effect on the communities that make it. And if we look for something that is actually good and valuable, that will flood our lives with pleasure and make everything better, it's a virtuous circle. Does that answer your question, Ed? It certainly does. It certainly does. Absolutely. Um, and obviously, the rare charity, uh, uh, you know, you've looked at things really, um, I guess, from the ground up with that as well, haven't you? And I, I, if I understand it correctly, um, you're, you're, you're supporting the families and the children of plantation workers through education. So maybe you could just tell us very quickly a little bit more about how that works. Well, I think it goes back to what Melanie and Nina said. It's long term sustainable change. It's no good if we just do something now and then forget about it later when our lives go back to being busy again. How do we affect long-term sustainable change? So I, I think by changing the system of how we buy tea, and it's the same with coffee and chocolate. Um, but also there's sustainability. We, we look at economic sustainability, ah, sorry, environmental sustainability, and we're very conscious of that. That's how our world is going to survive. And I think a lot of people have got that. The economic sustainability, that's the direct trade piece where you buy at a price the farmer sets rather than a commodity market. And then the social sustainability, how do you affect real change in the society? Sustainable change. And I think I went to the farms and said, if we take the fair trade element off, because 80% um, of the revenue we were raising with fair trade was going to fair trade. Um, and we give it directly to you. What would you want to spend it on? And I asked the families and the communities, the farms we work with around the world, and they all said they'd want better opportunities for their children. And they all identified education as that way of having better opportunities. We don't know from the outside how to change lives in India or Africa or Sri Lanka, but they do, their communities do, and give the children the economic advantage of the educational advantage, I believe they might be able to do that. And so it's not, um, what we do is not just um, basic education, but we're off offering tertiary education scholarships, university, so that you've got You've got these really, really bright kids who have no opportunity to go further, to take it further, to become the next judges, doctors, the middle class, the upper class, the, the ruling class, and give people from marginalized communities the opportunity to make real change. Gosh, that's a long answer, sorry. No, it's, it's super interesting, Edna. thank you. Um, perhaps we could turn this question around the supply chain over to you, Nina. Um, what have you heard from your partners, your producers, your suppliers uh, in your market about the current situation? And what are you doing with them to, to really ensure everyone gets a fair deal going forward and set up success in this uncertain time? 
Well, I mean, it's been really difficult because, you know, like I said, March 15th was pretty much the shutdown for the entire industry. And, you know, it was not something that we were building towards. It was pretty much overnight, you know, where we just said everybody has to shut down or they can just do takeout. So especially here in New Orleans, the springtime is, you know, it's our busiest time. You know, this is the money time where we have a lot of festivals, a lot of events going on. And March was looking really good for everybody because people had buyouts, people were doing, you know, a lot of events. And to have that shut down, I talked to a lot of my purveyors, a lot of my farmers, because they were producing for the busy season. And, you know, they just had to stop everything and nobody was buying anything because you know, restaurants supply so many things. And that's, and that's why it's so important for people to understand how impactful the restaurant industry is just with the supply chain. Um, we're talking about chicken farmers that had to, you know, they were, I mean, it was ridiculous here when restaurants shut down that farmers were throwing away food because they had, nobody was buying it. Um, and, you know, had, you know, pounds of onions just being thrown away because nobody was buying that milk was being thrown away because there was no restaurants to buy it. Um, and it was, it's a, you just can't tell a cow, stop producing milk, nobody's buying, it's not possible. You know, so it was kind of, it was really hard for people to scale back. And when they did scale back, they scaled back really hard. And now we're seeing that as restaurants are starting to slowly open up, the supply chain is, is, is greatly broken because, you know, I'm talking to my farmers and I'm like, hey, can you deliver, you know, 40 pounds of chicken? They're like, no. And they're like, we're, we're slow production now. We only have, you know, X, Y, Z pounds. And they, they are also like a lot of us restaurant owners where we are kind of uncertain of what's going to happen going forward. Will, be, will we uh, continue to open up or are we going to shut back down again? So they're kind of, we're in a holding pattern um, in terms of the long-term project, how sustained is the restaurant industry, because we really don't know. You do, you're seeing states spike here, um, and a lot of the governors are saying we need to go back from phase three to phase two to phase one. So now you're going from 75% occupancy in restaurants to 25%, uh, which is not a lot. So you're playing uh, this chess game, and it's doesn't affect just the customers, it also affects the farmers and all the producers, it affects. I, f I didn't even understand how this affected my linen company until we started opening up. And I'm like, hey, can you bring my linen on Wednesday? We open on Wednesday and they're like, no, we only, we're only open one day a week. We're only open on Mondays. And I'm like, because everybody's trying to make things work um, economically because it is, such a it's a gamble right now and people don't really want to open up all the way and then they're losing money because i everybody i've spoken to in all industries not just chefs farmers um wine producers everybody says to me i'm just trying to survive and lose less money it's not even about making a profit it's about losing less money at this point and i think that's where we're at we're in this holding pattern of just waiting for things to stabilize and it's tough because we don't have a vaccine yet and people are not traveling. So there's a lot of, you know, question marks floating around. So I think everybody's just trying to lose less money at this point. Um, yeah, no, and I, I completely agree. I mean, it is, it is really as simple as that, isn't it? Um, I think it's, it, it, it's, it's just, um, as always, the small guys are gonna are gonna be the ones to to, to kind of to to, to 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 suffer the to suffer the most. Um, and um, it, it it does feel like this has been a real, um, yeah, a real almost a kind of breaking point in a way for a lot of a lot of the smaller guys that were living kind of week to week, month for month. And you know, as yep. Henrietta was saying, people that are focused on on doing the right thing, um, which is which is really 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 tough. So I think um, it'd be great to just throw a couple of questions out there from uh, from the audience. Um, and um, so this first one, I, I, I think, is quite interesting. And I, I guess it, anybody who feels that they want to answer it can can jump in. Um, so Gary asks, do you think the challenge um, is um, do consumers know what is responsibly produced or sourced 
and are some, some brands guilty of misleading claims such as crafted. Um, and so I guess how we get this, um, get the right message across and stop allowing and accepting brands that, that, that greenwash um, to, 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 to sell their product. Can I just jump oh. in? Go on, sorry. No, no, go ahead, Henrietta. I was just going to say quickly, um, it's our responsibility to communicate more. And I think I was lazy before this and I, I pulled my hand up. I used the restaurant industry as a, a way of finding a route to market. And I didn't engage with consumers as much as I could have done to tell that story. And now I've got a rocket up my ass because I've got like, I've got to tell that story so they make the right choices so that, and then when they go back to the restaurants that they make the right choices and that it, that, can, that, that uh, communication is so important. And people look, it's amazing. We looked at the stats on the website, Rare Tea the other day, and we saw how long they spend on the website and what pages they look at. And it's wonderful to see, they really look like, what is your um, attitude to sustainability? What is your, um, uh, your, your attitude and your responsibility and your relationship with your, with your suppliers? It's really, people are spending 15 minutes sometimes before they make a purchase, making sure they're making a purchase with someone they believe in. That's extraordinary. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I, it, Nina, I, I, think what, I, think, I think what it comes down to is now that, you know, if you backtrack 20 years ago and you look on the shelves, there wasn't a lot of stuff to pick and choose from. And now we have a wide array of all these different things available to consumers. So now they're, they're trying to like basically pick and choose and they want to pick and choose for the right thing because also now people are more educated about these things um, and they want to make sure that they're doing the right thing. Um, and it's not just about the ingredients that they're consuming. It's also, where is it coming from? You know, um, and are, is a, is a company transparent? You know, a lot of people say that, oh, this is organic, but it's really not organic or whatever it, it is. But I think the consumers now is more educated in that sense where they're like, okay, I need to make sure that it's the right choice and what I'm, con what I'm consuming is for the, right, for the right purpose. So I think what it comes down to is that we have so many different products available, consumers more educated, and now they're a little more picky. Yeah, and cynical, which is kind of nice as well. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it, it's, it's putting the, sorry Mel, go on. No, I was saying that um, there's a course that we teach at the school called Conscious Capitalism. And it's the um, teaching the, the power of consumption. And we've seen so many changes in the diversity and inclusion world. Like, you know, people are actually afraid on Twitter these days to, because you have to have quite a robust, you have to be quite, uh, you have to be ready for your company to undergo scrutiny like never before. And on top of that, the consumers, you know, we have access to you like never before. There's not, there's not a veneer. We literally can not only share our opinion about you with our friends but with the world and so i on one hand even though yes it's, it's been it's quite scary sometimes it's actually entered into a beautiful place where there's a level of accountability where you know you have this um you've had organizations before say like they do um they they make baby stuff and there are no women on their board like mm. And this is a real case in the UK that was rectified. But then if you start to see those kinds of things, like you start to see, wait a minute, I'm eating at this Spanish restaurant, or I'm eating at a Mexican restaurant, but there are no Mexican people here. <laughs> What's going on? Like that, <laughs> I'm not saying anyone in particular, but you all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> like, you know, there's some things, <laughs> there are some weird things that happen here in the UK, but that, and that now what you're seeing is that Twitter's gone absolutely mad. Like they're, they're just saying, they're calling out people. And then on top of that, dedicating whole days to say, let's put our money and purchase things from certain communities so that we can really um, uh, kind of commit our capitalism. Uh, because right now we are the empowered consumer. That's what, that's what I'm driving for. Yeah. At every single point, we, yeah. Mm -hmm. Every single money, penny that we spend is, is, is pointed. Absolutely. But and it's so powerful, so powerful because they can drive change in big businesses through in a second. Exactly. Mm. And the challenge is for, for us with clients is always balancing the aspiration with the commercial reality. You know, we even have 
terms for it you know we call them hero products or we call them halo messaging and so there's 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 ways and it's it, it's always been a subconscious thing and there's ways of you know championing your organic coffee and your free-ranged eggs but it allows you to buy greenhouse grown mass-produced tomatoes from turkey and the cheapest okay. green beans from kenya and the the conversation that we always have with clients is, you know, there, there, there's always this aspiration to do better, but the metrics of the industry are such that you can very rarely, unless you're at the top end of the industry, apply that aspiration as, as, a, as a blanket across your whole business. So you do end up putting some things on a pedestal which sells an image and other things that make the bottom line. And, and I, I'm not saying I have the answer to that, but it's a real challenge well, from, but I think from the world point. that we live in. It really is. Like we do, we actually have a, an MBA like simulator game, guys, and it's called Conscious Capitalism. And all of my students, it's like 120 students, they run in, they're like, yeah, we're going to be conscious. We're going to pay our workers. We're going to, you know, market effectively. We're going to be inclusive. We're going to have great supply chains. And they all go bankrupt. Like every single, and, and so, <laughs> you know, with the HR policies, no, it's, <laughs> and I laugh every year because it's quite funny every year because they come out with this best intentions. This is what, but it costs to actually be responsible business. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but it's, I think that if we think it's naive to take um, anything beyond profitability in business, like if you look at the sort of um, the apprentice style approach to business, that profitability is the be all and end all. Anything else is stupidity. We never make any change and we never get better. Profitability has to be part of business. Otherwise we don't survive and we achieve nothing. But it can't be the only part. And there's huge value in, in, in your, in your um, sorry, in your um, reputation. And your reputation is as a business in hospitality is so crucial and when when you think about the uh, reputational damage of doing so, of working with um unethical products i think that it 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 has more um it has more value to you than it can just seem in its pounds shillings and pence absolutely and i guess organizations like b corp um one percent for the planet that we're members of and have been for three years you know there are people there that are talking about this triple bottom line of people planet and profit um or whatever they are it might be purpose planet and profit um and actually just trying to drive home that 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 kind of broader definition of success and 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 you know success within 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 business I think people choose rare key because we give a percentage of our revenue not profit but revenue to our for, to the charity that we're associated with and they think okay these are guys are putting their money where their mouth is and we can make it work yeah cool. yeah we we do a one percent match fund on all of our invoices um where we ask clients to donate one percent of the of the project total and we match it and um the only two clients that have asked to have that removed ever have been publicly listed large companies um so i guess moving on to the next question you know we've 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 talked a lot about the independent sector and suppliers and everything else and there's a there's a great question here actually um asking what about hotels and big organizations is it difficult uh due to the structure of companies and kind of long-term agreements that are in place and I, I guess ed i don't want to put you on the spot but uh, i think you know you guys work not 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 exclusively but, but but predominantly with the with the larger hotel groups so how, how have you found that 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 world of, 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 of aspiration versus this commercial reality um with with the larger hotels sorry i just, just reframed the beginning of the question i missed you there uh, yeah, so the, the question was what about hotels and big organizations is it more difficult uh due to long-term agreements and corporate structure? Um, well, I think it's certainly more difficult, but it, there's more of a responsibility there, uh, for sure. Uh, I mean, I, I know within Marriott, there's, there's been huge efforts um, in recent years, um, not just prompted by um, recent, um, the, you know, the, the recent pandemic and economic challenges, et cetera. Um, but yeah, there's a huge responsibility on those larger companies whether hotel groups or ownership groups, uh, development agencies, uh, to, to really lead the way of the change. But they're only going to do that if they're inspired by you know, the smaller operators, as, as we're saying, or inspired by the communities in which they live. So uh, I think the burden rests on, on everybody uh, at every level of society, but um, the, 
the big corporate companies are the ones that are going to affect that lasting change. Yeah, I guess their impact is so much greater just by just by default. Um, so the, the, the last question, um, but maybe before we, 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 we wind up, I know we're running over a little bit. So if anyone has to go, then just raise your hand or, you know, if you're in the audience, just 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 uh, you obviously feel free to jump off. Um, last question. There are so many things that we need to be aware of. Gender equality, pay gap, inclusivity of people of colour, fair supply chain. You can't do it all. Where to start? How do you choose what's more important? Um, does anyone want to come in on, on that? <laughs> so I would say all those things, what I, what I like to say is, um, it, it, uh, returning it back to business, those are all, of course, very important. But where's your biggest risk? You know, like if I just kind of look at the business side of it and say, where's your biggest risk? And it may not be what the loudest voice is at all. So for example, if you're a Mexican restaurant and you have no Mexican people working for you, I would say that you could probably, you, you know, someone's gonna call you out on Twitter pretty soon if you're not careful, particularly in this, in, in this environment. Um, additionally, if you know that, if you do a, a kind of a, a pay kind of analysis and you're seeing that a, a, a representative group of people are underpaid or it's, there's an equal pay, then you're probably gonna call, be called out quite soon. So you're right, there is a whole menu of activities that you should take, but what I am, um, and, and it is up to you and your own business model for you to really decide where your biggest risk is. But what key, what I would advocate is that you turn it into a risk mitigating exercise. I don't want you to, it's not charity. This is not, oh, I need to do the right thing. Yeah, because then you, it's easy to push to the side. But if you actually put it as part of your, um, your part of your strategy in terms of here are some of the risks in our business, looking at where things are, look at where things are moving, look at, at, at some of the topics that are being spoken about right now, then how do you mitigate the risk? Like, how do you take care of it? How do you dampen it? Meaning, and, and that will probably it will help you in terms of your prioritization of what you look at first, because you're right, there's a lot. And it's not the loudest, don't get it twisted. It's not because, you know, it's not the loudest voice that you should listen to. It's your own business model, what your plans are for the future, and also where your gaps are, where those, where are the, the biggest kind of gaps? Like, yeah, so, yeah. This is a journey as well. Inclusion is a journey. Culture change is a journey. So you're not going to be able to kind of, yeah, you can do a little metrics, a little, you know, kind of goals and stuff like that. Don't get me wrong. Of course, you could do a little target. But in terms of kind of true inclusion, you're going to be on this journey for a hot minute. It's a constant learning. It's changing. You know, a few years ago, we were talking about one thing and then now we have a much, a much more sophisticated view of what things are and, and so that's why what you're doing is just dedicating yourself to that journey that learning journey rather than it being okay i'm going to hit this one and then I'm move on to the next goal hit this one and then move on to the next goal unfortunately it's not like that yeah great well um, we're, we're out of time um i think that was really super interesting and i just want to say a special thank you to to each of the panelists, uh, Mel, Henrietta, Nina, thank you so much for taking your time. Thank um, you. It's super interesting and um, we'll stay in touch and uh, fingers crossed that we, uh, we come out of this sooner rather than later and we're in a much better place. Um, Ed, do you want to say a quick uh, goodbye? Yeah, no, just to echo your thanks. I think it's a really, uh, I think it's been a really interesting, interesting hour. And um, yeah, I guess it, 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 it's the start of, 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 of this narrative and, you know, regardless of our you know ge geographical location or race or gender or anything else i think it, it, it's 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 really insightful and it's inspiring to, to 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 feel like we've all got this responsibility to take the burden of our of our collective uh um, um you know humanity on our on our shoulders so thank you so much uh nina from new orleans and uh Henrietta and Melanie um, and um, so just a couple of housekeeping points it's uh, the what did we say Ed? I can't remember now and I've, I've got my I've lost my notes somewhere uh, <laughs> next Tuesday the 28th of July uh, so 11 30 Eastern Standard Time 4 30 p.m. Uh, British 
summertime uh, will be the next session details to be announced shortly and um, the recording of today's session will be sent out by the end of this week uh, please have a, a, a rewatch or a share if, uh, if if you found it compelling and you think that some other people might find it interesting um, and as always um, uh, we are on Instagram and uh, LinkedIn and as is Ed and Pure Grey um, so go go look us up um, easy easy to find and um, looking forward to seeing you all very soon. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us.